Hi, we're going to look at uh, Chapter 10, Routines, and the, uh, in the textbook for today. So, before we begin, think about all the routines that you do in your life. Get up each morning and uh, drink your coffee, eat your cereal brush your teeth, uh, maybe you have to get children ready each morning or fix them breakfast or, um, you know, or think about your routines at night, what you do uh, before you go to bed. Um, and then think about how you like to structure your routine. Do you like a really fixed routine? Or do you like it more spontaneous? And, you know, why do you like it like that? So, you know, think about that. And think about how that might impact how you do your classroom. How structured you might want your classroom to be. Or more spontaneous how you want that to be. And we talked a little bit about this last week. How children should always be learning, even when they're doing daily routines like eating or toileting, resting, grooming, or even dressing in the classroom. And NACI, one of its standards, talks about the relationships that you have with children in your classroom. So it's important to have these positive relationships because it helps develop personal responsibility within the children and that self-regulation where they can control themselves. And it's good for them to learn the, to have interactions with others and for their academic function for them now and for later. These are the elements of a daily instruction. It should, should include some kind of education, some teachable moments. It should have a clear beginning to the day and a clear ending to the day. There should be where needs are met. There should also be a balance between all these different things that are listed here. There should also be opportunities for children to make choices. The activities should be interesting, they should be age appropriate, they should be culturally appropriate, and they should be meaningful. So children should be learning. There should be varied opportunities for children. Some indoors, some outdoors, some quiet, some active, some where they can have a small group or maybe alone and then some large group activities. And think about the whole child. Think about their emotion, emotions and their social skills. Think about their mind and their body and help children build relationships with each other and with their caretakers in the class. So as we continue to think about caregiving as a curriculum, we want to think about interactions. And when we think about infants, we think about meeting their needs in a timely way. That will strengthen the bond between the caregiver and the infant, which is so important. During feedings, the caregiver can have conversations with the child. And the child can develop some language skills. The child doesn't understand everything you're saying, but it is the beginning of those language styles. So we want to be sure that um, we are very responsive and that we have high quality interactions with infants. Attachment is extremely important, that we are building trust with children, that we are building secure attachments with them, and we can do that by being consistent that we do things in a consistent manner, that we are responsive to them, that when they call for us, we are there for them, and that we're predictable. They know that things are gonna stay the same and that we, they can trust us to meet their needs. So we also want children to feel safe and secure when they are in our environment 
they may not feel that when they're at home, but we want them to feel that way while they are in our classroom. And we have to learn what children's verbal cues are. When they say something, they might say a word that is not exactly the word for lunch or their bottle, but we have to understand what that word that they're saying stands for. And we have to understand their nonverbal cues. When they lift their hands up, what does that mean? What are they trying to say to us? And each child may be different. So we have to learn those things about each individual child and be able to communicate with them and to know what their needs are. And it's really important that there's a primary caregiver for each child, maybe one or two in each classroom, and that the child can count on those caregivers being there. I know you're gonna be out for sickness and sickness for your child or your family sometimes, but those children need to develop strong attachments with those caregivers, so we need to be there and not be changing caregivers um, for those. So we're gonna talk a little bit about some of the different types of routines. And the first one is feeding. Infants, we know typically for the first four to six months, they will live on breast milk or formula. And um, after this, they begin to have food that is pureed or sometimes just baby food out of the jar. And then toddlers begin to have limited choices of foods that are safe for them to eat. And they begin to be able to feed themselves. A lot of times it's just with their hands because they can't use utensils yet. Preschool and school age children are competent eaters by now and they can pretty much uh, help with preparing food and making good nutritional choices. Toileting which is always a challenge. Uh, diapering is more than just a routine interaction. You should narrate to the child, tell the child what's happening, ask the child for help when the child is a little bit older, and you know, make this a smooth transition to toilet training. For preschoolers, um, they should learn to be very self-sufficient in this process. So our goal is to make them self-sufficient so that they can um, go to the restroom by themselves to be able to uh, wipe themselves and flush and wash their hands and button and zip up their own clothing eventually. So that's our goal is to make them self-sufficient. Rest time. One thing that's extremely important is to put infants on their backs. We want to prevent sudden infant death syndrome. This can happen when we do not put infants on their backs, so it is very important to do that. Toddlers and preschoolers typically take naps, and during this time when they uh, lie down for a nap, they might miss their families or might have a hard time going to sleep. So this can be a rough time um, to, uh, to, to deal with children. And you have to, most of the time, have individual um, strategies for trying to help children to rest. School-aged children rarely have a nap time, but it's important to have times where they can rest and have quieter activities. Dressing and grooming. All children should learn how to groom and dress themselves eventually, get to the point when it's appropriate to learn how to button and zip and snap. And um, sometimes at some schools I've seen where each child had their own individual comb or brush and they can brush or comb their hair after nap time. Um, but each child should have opportunities to be able to learn these skills in dressing and grooming. Inclusion. We have to make sure that we get guidance from families because we may not particularly know 
how to feed a child who has special needs. So we have to ask families how to feed children, what are the special instructions, and same thing with toileting, how we need to help the child. The child may need special help, it may take longer. Same thing with resting, may need, the child may need a special positioning, um, dressing and grooming, the child may need more help than a typical developing child. And so we have to get direction from the parents on um, how to help the child. Transitions are when you move between one activity or routine to the next. We have to think about children's needs when we're planning transitions. We have to think about children's attention spans and we have to plan transitions to make sure there's not chaos that happens in classroom. So think about your experience with transitions in young children. Some of you had lab classes and some of you haven't. So you might have seen um, either in your own classroom or in lab classrooms where a bell might have been sounded to alert children that it's time to clean up. Maybe the lights were turned out, that it's getting too loud in the classroom and that children need to quiet down. Or maybe you've heard the teacher clap their hands for it's time to go to center time. Or you've heard a teacher to start singing a song that it's time to start cleaning up. And think about what is challenging about transitions. What is difficult? I found sometimes that children aren't ready to clean up. Maybe they're not finished with center time. They don't want to move to the group time um, or we're trying to get children to line up. Sometimes children want to all be at the beginning of the line or they all want to be at the end of the line or you know you, you just have different challenges, challenges with transitions. Maybe it's really chaotic with moving a whole group of children. If you have everybody at center at group time having um, a circle time and you want to move everybody to center time, if you just say, okay, let's go to center time, then you have everybody start running and knocking people over. That's definitely not a good transition to do that. So you have to have a way to get the children to move from group time to um, the center. So here's some ways to make transitions successful. You warn children ahead of time. So you might say, if they were in the centers working, you might say five minutes and we are going to move to group time. We're gonna close down centers. So just giving you five minute warning. You also try to arrange transitions so there's just a little bit of waiting time. If children had, to wait a long time, then there can be some problems. We know that they don't have a lot of patience to be able to wait. If you line up the whole class in a long line and try to say, let's all wash our hands, and the other children, there's 12 children waiting in line to wash their hands, those other 11 children don't have anything to do while one child's washing his or her hands. So you certainly don't want all those children lined up waiting to wash their hands. You should have something to do. Maybe you're reading a book and you have one child at a time go up to wash his or her hands. And then when that child gets finished, they tap someone on the head and that child gets to go wash his or her hands. So you want to eliminate chaotic and crowded areas. So if it's time to get items out of their cubbies to go home. You certainly don't want to say everyone go to your cubbies and get your um, papers out of your cubbies and your coats to go home because the cubby area is very small so it would be very crowded and there might be pushing and shoving. So you may say Kevin and Jane go get your items out of your cubbies and the rest of the 
children are at circle time singing a song with you and then you pick two more children to go do that. And also, you may be having children who are finished cleaning up from centers and they are coming to the carpet for group time. And you certainly wouldn't wait till all the children get there to start your group time because then those children who are finished cleaning up, they're just sitting there with nothing to do. And that's the time when they are kicking and start wrestling and doing things like that. So as soon as children start coming to your group time, you start those songs or the finger plays or reading a book or you get the group time started. Other times when you do transitions are when they come in in the morning, the arrival times. Um, so you have to think about what are you going to do when they begin the day. So make sure that your environment is inviting and make sure there's something for children to do when they come in in the morning and think about some kind of specific ritual for them so it's an easy transition and because we know it's difficult for children to leave their families sometimes. Departures when they leave at the end of the day that can be emotional sometimes too. Um, it's hard to leave their caregiver. You um, are important to them as a teacher and it is difficult for you to for them to let you go sometimes and to go home with their parents so we have to think about um, you know how that how we can make that transition easy for them so in your mind you could think about these questions that are on the slide um, some of you are working in centers and you use transitions and you know in some ways they could be difficult for you and some ways they have been easy for you so uh, think about that and how you can make transitions better. Let's look at this story this is uh, Christopher and he cries when his mother or father leaves him and then when they take him home and this student teacher says maybe he has a transition problem and um, let's see if he has trouble at other times um, so she finds out that it's hard to get him to quit doing something and start doing something else and his mother says yeah he has the same problem at home so the teacher that works in the class told the student teacher here's some five suggestions that I would recommend um, be careful and not push the child too much. Understand that this particular child has a hard time accepting change and doesn't do well with transitions. So um, just understand that, that this child's going to take longer than other children. Make sure that your routine is very consistent and very predictable for this child. Don't change it up too much and then prepare the child for transitions you know give that warning that we that i talked about a few minutes ago before cleanup you may even go over to him specifically and say christopher in five minutes we're going to be cleaning up instead of just saying it out loud in the classroom go directly to him and say it to him and then give him plenty of time and make sure that you know he has a little bit of extra time you know maybe he needs extra two minutes or so and don't be too upset it doesn't always work so just be patient with him and be understanding with him and maybe you know it'll eventually get better and the crying's going to stop and um you know you may even try some different transitions that he might enjoy a little bit better maybe try some you know using a triangle or maybe a flute or a, a guitar sound maybe he enjoys something different than what you're using maybe the transition items that you're using are not that interesting or exciting so maybe try something different cleaning up is difficult for a lot of children some of them never have to do it at home their parents do it for them so at your classroom you make sure that 
when you say clean up that the children know where the items go. Some, ch some teachers label things. They have, um, like for the blocks, they might have the shapes marked on the block shelves so they know exactly where to put them. Or they might have a picture of Legos on a basket so that children know like all the Legos go in this basket. Or they have the teddy bears on labeled on this bin so the children know all the teddy bears go in this bin so it should be some a learning activity especially for this so that they can match up the objects to the picture that are on there sometimes you can even say you know make it fun and say let's count or um, let's see how quickly we can get these bears in um, in there and I'll time you um, some children, I mean, some teachers use cleanup songs or signals, and the children will sing the songs while they're cleaning up, and you try to finish before the songs are over. Group time, as I was talking about, is um, a time when the whole class comes together, and you definitely can build a sense of community. You can focus on race and gender um, because everybody comes together so you have that diversity coming together you can focus on emotional development at that time and interpersonal skills that's a good time when you can read books and read them aloud you can also work on problem solving with the class group time for infants and toddlers um, should be very brief and spontaneous so remember that it's not always appropriate for them um, so you have to be very careful that it is short very very short for them it's more appropriate for preschool or school programs so to make it successful you want to remember the attention span of the group that you have and how long you're going to have your group time even though you have three-year-olds Maybe this year, your group of three-year-olds doesn't have a very good attention span, so you know you have to shorten your group time. So you want to make sure that all the children have an opportunity to participate. You don't want to just pick one child to do something. You want to make sure all the children are participating. So if you have a um, butterfly puppet that you're going to um, use during a song and you give it to one child to be able to raise the puppet you know that one child's getting to participate but the rest of the children are not maybe you make tiny butterfly puppets for every child on the stick and this way every child gets to raise up the puppet during the song make sure your area is large enough for all the children to sit comfortably so that they have plenty of space to move because it should be a time when children are participating, they are active, they are moving and make sure they can actually see you as the teacher, be able to see the book, see the materials that you're showing. It's really aggravating to children if they can't see the pictures in the book or they can't see what you're showing to everybody. Um, so make sure they can all see and it's extremely important that you prepare ahead of time if you are doing a group activity and then you have to run to the back of the room and get your book or go over to the counter and get some tape because you didn't get your tape to tape something up that you need and the children you're going to lose them immediately when as soon as you have to go and get all these supplies that you forgot to get because you weren't organized you have to get have everything ready ahead of time at the beginning of group time you draw children in by you know using finger puppets or doing an interactive song um, doing something interesting saying something interested um, having something in a bag that says oh you won't believe what I have in this bag can anybody guess what it's going to be in this bag you know get something that will draw them in to entice them to make them think group time is going to be really interesting and this one can be tricky make participation a choice and this I don't see very often 
most classrooms that I visited, it is required for children to participate in group. But our book is suggesting, and I wish we were in class to discuss this, but our book is suggesting that the children get a choice whether they want to participate in group time or not. This could be very controversial. So I wonder about your thoughts on this and maybe next time we're together, you can bring this up and we'll talk about it. But I just wonder what your thoughts are on whether children should have a choice if they participate in group time. So what have you learned about routines in this chapter? Think about all the things that we've talked about. What aspects of the early care routines would you most look forward to teaching children and why? For this week, you have a quiz and I'll have 10 questions. It's not timed and um, you can find the answers in your textbook. And then you will have the second test of this um, semester. It is on chapters 8 through 12 and it is due on Sunday, November 14th, same as the quiz. So you have until then to get both of these uh, submitted. So make sure when you get finished you click the submit button so the grade will come to me and you'll be able to see your grade after you submit um, the quiz and the exam. So um, take your time on this because they're not timed, so you can definitely look through your textbook and through your notes and get the answers and you should get a good grade on that. The quiz, like the other quizzes, you can take twice and your highest grade will count. Your exam or your test, you can only take that once. Um, so be careful and take your time with that. Like I said, it's not time, so you have plenty of time to do that. 